the number of children each woman contributes goes through first reading on the hill today. The raising of children is best done by highly trained professionals. This is the worst of tyrannies, the forced dissolution of the family unit. Why do adults use memory? By removing painful memories, it reduces stress and gives us inner peace. Nobody has a mommy or a daddy child. Welcome back to Boys Bible Study, the only podcast that is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. As always, I am your co-host, Ash, and my co-hosts are... Scott and Julian. And our guest today, the curator and presenter behind Museum of Home Video and the theatrical sales director at AGFA a.k.a. the American Genre Film Archive. Please welcome Brett Berg. Hey, Brett. Thanks for having me. Uh, long-time listener, first-time caller. Yeah, yeah. so nice to have you, um, fellow radio s- streamer, presenter. I love what you've been doing with Museum of Home Video. Um, it's really Thank fun. You. And um, I was hoping you would talk about that a little bit because I honestly think anyone who listens to Boys Bible Study would have a lot of fun watching you on Tuesdays. Well, thank you. Uh, it is a new weekly show on Twitch that is found footage based. And uh, I focus on the history of showbiz. I like to, to bring up old uh, talk show, late night talk show clips, uh, MTV air checks, rare music videos, rare news items, promotional videos, training videos, anything that was broadcast, I tend to collect sitcoms, um, I don't know. And I just weave it into this 90 minute presentation that it's very uh, quickly paced and isn't boring. I think that's the the main thing with found footage is to make sure that you're not boring your audience. Oh yeah. No, the, the program's really like engaging and inventive. Um, I loved the most recent show that you did as of our time of recording this. One of the things you featured was like the first hours of the weather channel, like ever uh, yes. broadcast. That was crazy. I had never seen that before. Yeah. It's very uh, proto vaporwave. So uh, in 1982, the weather channel comes on the air and CNN just two years before in 1980 was the first 24 hour cable channel, I believe. And it was all news, so it just stands to reason that there would be an all-weather channel. And it was uh, it was a monumental effort at the time because the tech was not really quite there. It was very expensive, and so everything on screen kind of looks like the movie War Games. <laughs> They're in the NORAD of weather forecasting. And uh, it's just a really impressive document of a wildly different time. Yeah, it's like war games visuals, but in the background they're playing the like the song Summer Song by Chad and Jeremy, and it's just like <laughs> supremely chill. Oh, it was so vibey. And of course, in that LA found footage scene, of course, there's a, a crossover with the Everything is Terrible crew, of which you know Scott is a part of. And you're uh, you're showing one of Julian's uh, pieces. By the time this episode comes out, it, this uh, tomorrow's screening will have happened, but. It's cool that you and Julian are collabing on on this week's Museum of Home video. Yeah, uh, Julian cut a thing uh, a few years ago. Well, actually, Julian, you want to describe it? <laughs> it's your movie. Uh, yeah, well, it's <laughs> Stephen King's movie. <laughs> I uh, recut the movie thinner so the guy got thicker as the movie went along <laughs> in reverse. It's called Thicker. Um, and Brett was nice enough to... Um, showcase it on uh, this past week's museum of home video i think it was originally scott who passed it to me if i'm not oh. mistaken well thank you scott brothers in podcast <laughs> that, that sounds correct i i love it julian it's so good thank you and brett uh as far as the weather channel thing goes i i love when i can watch a video and the whole time i'm thinking like who cares? Why would anyone care? But I'm completely engaged. And that was absolutely one of those. Yes. That's kind of what I specialize is in things that you would never think would be fascinating. Things that on paper don't read is totally engrossing. But when you watch the show as one presentation, the vibe comes across, I think. It does. It does. We'll remind people at the end too, but um, how? what's your schedule with streaming Museum of Home Video and, and where can people watch that? It's every Tuesday night from 7.30 to 9 Pacific. 
and it's on Twitch. So it's twitch.tv slash museum of home video. And we've only, as of this recording, I'm about to do show number five. And I think that we're, it's, I, I believe in what uh, the MST3K people used to say in that it's not everybody will get this, but the right people will get this. I feel like we're reaching the right kind of found footage weirdo who just, uh, it's the same kind of people who would come out to these shows if the shows happened in IRL, you know. It's just very heartening to see. On Tuesday, the chat was very lively. It was fun just like live interacting with anyone else who wanted to just watch the weather channel with me on a Tuesday night. So <laughs> I had a lot of fun. Uh, everyone listening, subscribe to twitch.tv slash museum of home video and uh, hang out with us in the chat. Uh, well, you know, Brett's presenting. I will just often be watching in chat. So come hang out with us. <laughs> And actually, Brett, this is a question I have for you as a, a great movie programmer as well, amongst the other things that you are. Um, do you find that in this Twitch era that some movies that you wouldn't have shown to people before or watched with people before are now relevant with Twitch because you can chat over it and get through some parts that might be too boring to show to like a, a live audience? Yes, this happened yesterday, actually. So in addition to the Tuesday night shows, I started experimenting yesterday with a very long form hangout session where I'm just showing things unedited, things that I just recently downloaded that I honestly didn't even know what they were, some of them. And at the very end, we watched the entirety of Crocodile Dundee in Los Angeles, aka Crocodile Dundee 3. And it's no good. It's no fun. <laughs> it's not It's not for humans, and I don't rec recommend you watch it. However, there were something like 15 or 20 people left. And only a handful of those people were chatting. And I knew every single one of those people personally. And it was a great way to watch something that in real life, <laughs> I would never, ever expect people to pay a ticket <laughs> to go see. <laughs> It was the one they finally just made for crocodiles to watch. <laughs> totally. <laughs> well, uh, you know, spe speaking of media that's possibly not fit for human consumption, um, hard to say. I don't know. I mean, I liked it. <laughs> well, I think we all did to some extent. The movie that we forced Brett to watch with us today is a pretty obscure pseudo-Christian film from 2012, simply titled remember and i think it was julian who found this one uh, how did you find it um i was trying to remember a science fiction christian web series that i saw on um i think indiegogo a while ago and um just searching those keywords on indiegogo on any crowdsource uh, or crowdfunding website yields a lot of great results and so just digging through a lot of um unfulfilled dreams on those websites and this was one of the few ones i was able to find where they actually finished the movie i mean usually uh the movies will have like a goal of like twenty thousand dollars or more and i think this one had like a funding goal of four four grand or something like that right and so it easily got its funding and the campaign ended a few years ago. So I was able to find it. Um, Movie Maker Films, I think, is the production company <laughs> based out of uh, Calgary. Just what you see on the tin. Movie Maker Productions. <laughs> we love it. Yeah. What else do they do? My my grandpa, the detective. Yeah, my grandpa, detective. <laughs> And um, they also have a documentary about, like, fathers raising their kids um, through Christ and through, like, being their mentors. Uh, really? It's a documentary, yeah. That seems like it has um, a lot to do with this movie. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess well, the, the family unit and uh, maintaining that is a big part of this movie and seems to be a big theme in their other movies even my grandpa the detective right i looked this up while we were watching the movie this uh, this documentary and it's called entrusted with arrows which is yeah. quite quite poetic and ridiculous title um entrusted with arrows colon entrepreneurial homeschool fathers Holy oh shit. yeah so wow. it's about uh yeah fathers who like work from home a lot of them are like craftsmen and 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 things of that ilk and um, it's sort of how they 
bring their kids into their uh, craft. The description on their website was uh, poignant and also sounds very culty. So I actually copied and pasted it. What does it say? This highlights the efforts of a few Christian men who take extreme measures to directly train up their children in the way they should go. They do this by not only educating them at home, so they're homeschooled, but by developing businesses which allow them to be with their children on a regular basis, living side by side with them, following the commands of Deuteronomy 6. Yeah, it does seem then that the family is a big source of anxiety and fascination for uh, Dallas Lammerman and Greg Lammerman, um, the director and writer respectively of the film Remember that we just watched. You will find as we're discussing Remember <laughs> that, you know, it, it is all about the family, how the future is going to destroy the family, the steps we can do now to prevent that from happening. And um, I don't know, it presents it in a really I guess, fun and engaging way. <laughs> now, this movie is like extremely convoluted and I do not think we should even attempt to like try to nail it beat by beat. But... Thank you. <laughs> let's take Boys Bible Study listeners through Remember. Um, let's, let's let people decide for themselves if, uh, if they want to invest, if they want to donate to this Indiegogo and invest an hour 45 <laughs> into, into Remember. Um, and as we're talking about it, I'm sure uh, some of its main themes and anxieties will come to the surface and we can interrogate them. But uh, who wants to who wants to start us off? The year is 2050. We see progressively things getting worse from 2020 to 30 to 50. But it's never really explained, or at least we didn't hear, where the strife was coming from and what it was doing to society. Yeah, that was that was the thing I was sort of waiting for the whole time. I was like was there some sort of event, you know, was there some sort of like cataclysmic event that, you know, made everything strange that like represented the, the tide turning in a dark way, but there really wasn't, I guess it was just supposed to represent like the gradual decline. It's kind of hard to piece together where things happened in the film. Cause it was a lot of like really strange images and dialogue. But the first thing I really remember is like the classroom full of kids being like, every like i don't own anything like everything i have belongs to someone else and like children should not know their father and mother just like like repeating in a in a group these like strange like hyper socialist maxims which is really funny children let's stand and recite the three pillars pillar one no father shall know his child and no child shall know his father. Pillar two, nothing belongs to anyone. Everything belongs to everyone. Pillar three, memory leap keeps us all safe and happy. So th this movie bounces back and forth between showing these children in this anonymous facility somewhere in a, in a snow strewn landscape a lot of it's just shot on like an elementary school playground. But then there's also this, the A plot is this uh, minority report style cop who uh, seems to be tracking people. What is he tracking them for? Oh gosh, child abduction? Yeah, that seems to be the big thing that comes up. There's always like a child abduction he has to go investigate. Yeah. Yeah, actually, you know, uh, one thing I definitely wanted to bring up was the very obvious like science fiction points of reference for this film. What were its like secular sci-fi points of reference? Well, I think it's two movies in particular, and I believe it's THX 1138 and Minority Report. And uh, THX, I think a lot of mediocre filmmakers unknowingly have used it as a reference because George Lucas, they were Star Wars fans who may have watched THX only once because they were maybe a little bit bored by it. And they'd only watched it in the first place because it was a Lucas movie. But it's it's plausible that this filmmaker never saw the movie and instead is copying what was already a copy, if that makes sense. Sure, sure. The other one is uh, Minority Report by Spielberg. This movie is, remember, is so obsessed with the pinch and throw technology that Minority Report kind of pioneered in its special effects. And that's that's 
this movie can't stop showing you it. Oh yeah, that's so true. Uh, yeah, the, basically, like, so you know, this movie was actually pretty cheap budget wise. I mean, it only cost a couple thousand, but I mean, the graphics were very. I mean, they were obviously low budget, but they were kind of sophisticated, and they really just like wanted to beat you over the head with like how good they thought they were at the graphics. Like everything was just like flat surfaces with like people talking on it and like uh like throwing around like electronic notes and stuff like that it was so funny yeah and then they had these plexiglass phones that were kind of amazing but also the font were the fonts used in the movie as the default font of the technology that everybody uses is either impact (laughs) which is (laughs) it's the meme font baby it's a meme font or it's like one of those fonts where it's actually supposed to be displaying Asian letter characters, but it's typing out English. So it looks kind of weird and, and like eighties dot matrixy yeah. in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very simple UI as, uh, as they say in the biz, which I think is smart from a low budget filmmaking method. Like it's, that was a good move to just, buy a few pieces of plexiglass that they can use again and again and just then add that in in post. At one point, they were using a like a, f- a flexible computer screen and it was just a transparency sheet. <laughs> yeah. That's all yeah. it was. <laughs> yeah. At one point, it even had somebody's handprint on it, on the back of it. <laughs> Oh really? I didn't get that's so funny. I didn't catch that. But yeah, it was like any any like trans translucent material. Yeah, the cell phones were just kind of like a a cut piece of high quality plastic or like maybe a crystal, um, which actually looked kind of badass. Uh, if you could just take like a rectangular crystal out of your pocket and then look at it like a phone. Uh, but yeah, the other techniques they used were like basically like saran wrap, like hung up as if it was curtains with stuff projected on it. And like, yeah, like you said, like literally just like transparencies from, from a, from a projector, um, Mm -hmm. all just with like fonts, the fonts that are buried deep at the bottom of Microsoft word, uh, 2000, you know? Yeah. A lot of the movie's action takes place in, uh, what appears to be like a junior high school during winter break. Yeah. And, uh, they would have a transparency sheet lying around for sure. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Or I did think it was possibly the back halls of a big church as well, which they too might have a transparency sheet. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. In 2012. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. So wait, I've, you know, I've actually not seen THX, um, but it also has to do with like taking various drugs and substances, yes. right? Yeah. It's, it's about a, like a, let's say a 25th century society where everybody stays indoors and underground and they pacify the populace with inane television and uh, psychoactive pills that just pill them out. So everybody in the society is totally pilled out. And it's about Robert Duvall who realizes that the medication is the problem and he ditches the meds and ditches the police and goes on a they, the police chase him and yada, yada, yada. But it's the first half of this movie felt like the first half of THX where it's about the humdrum of the bad marital relationship where nothing's really happening because they're all pilled out. And then the TV that they watch and their routines in the home and the pills they take. So it just seemed very similar to that. And because everybody was a Star Wars fan, it stands to reason that anyone who makes a movie who's a star Wars fan probably has seen THX at least once. Maybe. Yeah. Minority report was just on TNT a lot. I'm sure. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) In that era. So that does bring up now what the main thing that's happening in this movie, why it's called remember is that basically society's so shitty now that everyone's taking forget pills every day. And so they just forget that their kids were stolen from them or that life sucks in general. Right. Yeah, there's I think there's like two main drugs that are being taken in this movie. There's basically like a forget drug and a remember drug. The the forget drug, if I'm not mistaken, are these like weird like red pills. Um, I think they're just like aspirin. 
Um, Definitely aspirin. <laughs> yeah, that that everyone's taking. Um, the use of the drugs is so widespread among society that there's like literally a scene where the female protagonist, there's two main characters. They're like a married couple. The female protagonist is like crying against a fence and this just like random old woman on the street approaches her and is like, I think you need one of these, honey. And just like hands her. <laughs> They're like, like it, this, the, this prescription is so widespread that people will literally just like give you a hit on the street if you look like you're going through a rough time, you know? In front of a uh, lot full of children as well. Right. But at so at the same time as this, you know, this forget drug is like really prominent. The main character who, by the way, is like a policeman and his name is and I have to look at IMDb because this dialogue was so inscrutable. I, I really don't remember anyone's <laughs> name. Uh, the main character is named Captain Carl Onaway. So his name's Carl. <laughs> um, and there's like for a big portion of the exposition of the movie he's abusing like a blue goo like he's like rubbing a blue goo on himself and i guess that's what the pill i mean that's the drug that makes you remember right well whenever he squirted a little of the blue goo in his hand and clenched his fist he went on a parade of memory that usually took him back to a trauma of something about like children being separated Right. Does that sound right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But were they his memories? I was also not clear on whether we were seeing his memories or somebody else's memories. I thought it was his memories until the end. Then I questioned it. It's it's the fact that this psychoactive shaving gel that he keeps squirting into his hand, <laughs> it, it triggers these flashback visions and the visions are e like infinitely more interesting than the rest of the movie. So I would always not be quite paying attention to the lead up. I was always really engaged in it when it was the flashback. Absolutely. M yeah. Much like the reality posited in this movie, it's so much of a snore that you just want to forget it as quickly as possible and then retreat into your own world of fantasy. You know, I, I have a theory though, that that's how you're supposed to take the movie. And that's why they tell you what day it is before every single scene. <laughs> <laughs> because you two are supposed to forget and be like, wait, did that happen already? You already had the cinnamon buns. I don't remember either. Oh, the fucking cinnamon buns. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> well, we'll get to those in a moment. Cause that for some reason is like a huge like image in the movie that the plot hinges upon. But um, I just wanted to mention more like the other ways he takes the blue goo. Cause yeah, it's a psychoactive drug that seems to be like, with contact to skin is what gets you high off it. So he like starts off as Brett said, just like sort of rubbing it in his palm. But then I guess he like needs it harder. So he like, at one point he like takes out one of his teeth. He has like a fake tooth and he like puts oh, yeah. the goo like in his tooth and puts it back in his mouth. And his wife is like, you're going too hard off that stuff. And he's like, you know, it's because I have to help people. It's just like, it was really strange, you know? Careful, Carl. This has to be done. Why? Every day I do this, I get information that frees more families. When does it get to be our turn? Carl, it's getting dangerous. Soon, Wendy, soon. I think it needs to be today. No, we don't have the information in place yet. Just give me a few more days. And he like puts it on the the bottom of somebody's like lunch tray so he can like trigger them without their consent into being in a state of remembering. Well, he there he's breaking out of prison. He gives right. that to the prison guard, right? Who seems to love the drug. He's like, oh yeah, and they they cut to a shot of his pupils going nuts mm -hmm. at one point. <laughs> yeah. What was this? What is the overall thesis here? It is very hard to define. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Don't separate kids from their parents. Right. <laughs> um, I guess. No, I, I think that that's very true, but I also think it's like, so to me, yeah. So the primary anxieties of the movie are one, the idea that in the future, kids won't have a regular mother and father. They get stolen away from their parents at birth. Um, also there's, I think just a big anxiety about like, 
self medicating uh, or just like being on medications for like mental health issues. My idea of the central thesis of the movie, and let me know if you agree with this or not, was basically like too many kids are on, you know, uh, are diagnosed with ADD. Like too many people have depression now and they want to take the SSRIs. Um, everyone just wants to be on a pill, uh, you know, and, and if you do that, it's going to make society gray. And also, you know, liberals want to destroy the family. And these two things are actually one and the same. And they're, they're forces that are helping each other uh, to create a, a dark future. Wow, that was in that movie? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would have never guessed that because I was just too blinded by those hideous white sweater vests with the cut-off <laughs> sleeves. Yeah, everything in this movie was just like like monochrome. It was very like, okay, so like I think that, so, you know, nowadays like neoliberalism is a big buzzword and I being a pseudo intellectual have a very like pop idea of that word. And I use it to describe like a sort of like corporatized, like monoculture that, and like an aesthetic specifically, I use it like aesthetically to describe like a corporatized monoculture that's threatening to like shut down everything, like actually, you know, with soul, like, the gentrification apartments, like every interior in this movie reminded me of like my imagination of those like apartments that are going up all around Los Angeles that look like glorified dorms, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I I think that this was like, like a a movie about like the dangers of, of neoliberal like aesthetic. Like, I I don't know. That's just my (laughs) grasping at air here. I'm looking at the beginning now where they go through the years of what led to 2050. Yeah. And I don't know if y'all remember, but there's this one still at the beginning when it's 2029 and there's different clearly family folks holding up protest signs. One says homes for all a little boy, a frowning little boy has one that says my new bed is made from asphalt exclamation point. And then another couple has one that says, where are we supposed to live? Okay. So there's, there's a homelessness crisis. So maybe, hmm, because I actually remember saying this when we were watching because it was actually really tough for me simply to like keep up with the rhythm of the movie at first. Like it was showing me so many things that I found it really hard to get into it. So now hearing you remind me of that, I wonder if like homelessness crisis led to like a rise in socialism and like socialist thought, but then the socialism infected the culture and demanded like the end of the nuclear family and things like that. Does that track? Well, there's that news at the beginning too, where they're talking about like how the population got too low. So then there was like a mandatory three kids. And so then it was getting too (sighs) high. Look, the crash of 2029 was caused by the sudden population decline of the 20s. Fearing a population explosion, people stopped having children. And when the boomer generation began to disappear, the economy imploded and we were devastated. Reducing the birth quotas will cause negative growth and repeat the very same mistake. Brenda, you believe a three-child quota is unsustainable. How do you respond to Mark's allegations? What Mark is choosing to ignore is the government's role in these matters. In previous generations, the birth rate was at the whim of individuals. The government tried using education and other programs, but was unable to actually regulate the birth rate. Through careful controls, we can moderate the stress on the economy. You believe the current quota presents a risk? Yes, I do, as do most informed analysts. Right now, each productive citizen is overworked and overtaxed. Because people always, you know, when they, they, when Americans go on their like dark fantasies about China and stuff, isn't their whole thing that like, you're only going to be allowed to have like one kid. But in this world, it's like, you have to have three kids. But well, judging by how many families worked on this, maybe they were like only three kids. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Scott brings up the point that at the end of this movie, if you just look at the credits, first of all, like everything is ludicrously credited. Like every name is just listed for every (laughs) role for some reason. But also there's like families with like seven or eight members that are all worked as like the lighting designer somehow. It's like very strange. My favorite credit was... 
editing and uh, what was it editing and special effects Dallas Lammy man who's mm-hmm. the director and then directly below that it was special effects Dallas Lammy man <laughs> <laughs> hey credit where credit is due I mean truly totally. yeah there's a lot a lot of credit a lot of credit due in this movie I would say um so yeah like that, that's a good point. And, and we were sort of itching to try to figure out if there was a specific like religious denomination that the, you know, Lamamans were a part of that was like all about having as many kids as possible. Like, I don't know. We speculated at one point, like, are they like Mennonites or something? I, I don't know. It, but I, I'm, we're having trouble finding that information. This is a pretty like, you know, obscure production. But yeah, in this movie, like having three kids felt like a sacrifice and certainly you know there's families who have a lot more than three kids but i don't know a lot of families having three or less kids is like very normal like i don't have the statistics on this but i would i would guess that more families than not have three or less kids so that was a really interesting way to start but then they were really anxious that like population control would lead to like the state being the ward of all kids and also like forced sterilization if you were carrying your third child. And at one point in the movie, they start talking about post birth abortion, which is like, Oh, I missed that. There's, it was just for a second. It was just like for a split second. It came on in a news broadcast. With the passage of bill 27 comes the question of post birth abortion. Opponents say that while third child newborns will put a strain on our economy, they will benefit the economy in the long term. Supporters say that child numbers are swelling too quickly and population controls need to be more rigorously enforced. Debate will begin in committee today. And it was like lawmakers are considering post-birth abortion, which is such a like planned parenthood, like, uh, oh, yeah, dark fantasy, you know. I think that really tracks with a lot of sex of Christianity. Yeah. Life's a life. Right. A life is a life. And yeah, there's this, uh, there's this anxiety that abortion will just lead to like, where does it end with abortion? Like at that point you can just, you can just kill a kid when they're already alive. I mean, you know, what's to say? Like, why don't you just, what's the difference? Right. Right. Um, And that became like an eventuality. But I don't know. I I found it a bit confusing because on one hand, it was like they expected people to have kids to like up the population because it was too low. But they were also really into like killing kids if there just weren't the right amount. So it just I don't know. It was a little contradictory in a very confusing way. What matters is that the government controls how you run your family. Yes, I talked about this a little earlier but in that scene earlier where they just had the kids chanting things like like no child should know their mother or father i was like all right bernie sanders rally 2050 like they got my they got my man bernie like brain in a jar you know on a robot and like here are his here are his his charges you know um it was great love to see the kids keep hey the children are the future you know and televisions in the future are just saran wrap pinned to the wall. Right. <laughs> yeah. Which is great. That's so much more affordable. It's earthquake safe. True. Um, your small child can't accidentally pull it down on themselves. Yeah. If they do, I mean, the worst that might happen is they get suffocated. You know, they're not going to get crushed. Oh, I guess you don't watch the kid anymore. It doesn't matter. That's a good point. The state watches the kid. Although I, I, I will say I do love the... Um, after last season quality of that, where the TV is just saran wrap. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm glad. Oh, you s- good reference. Yes. I'm glad you said that because I, I almost said that during the movie, like it, it came to mind. Something about this movie reminded me of after last season, which um, boys Bible study listener, if you haven't seen after last season, it's a pretty legendary and I kind of hate this term, but it's a pretty legendary, like so bad. It's good film. Like, like a film like The Room or something like that. It's it's a, a pretty well-known, like highly regarded movie that was like a failure in many ways. Um, but this movie and After Last Season were similar in that they also took place in these kind of like sparse, like monochromatic rooms with just like 
random screens and like signs taped to things and it's like yeah i would call it an unfurnished suburban nightmare yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> the the main difference between this film and after last season is like didn't after last season cost like eight million dollars somehow like it was like <laughs> Yeah, it felt like a like a money laundering or tax dodge yeah. situation. It's not a it, after last season is not a real movie, right? Nor nor is it tolerable to people who aren't hardened to this kind of thing, right? But it but it's a very specific pleasure for very specific moviegoers, and it's not the room because the room appeals to jocks. This appeals to no one. Yeah, and it's yeah, and it's that all of us on this podcast at the moment are fans of movies for no one very much. So that's why we can sit through it. But yeah, th this film definitely had an after last season esque quality to it. Although th that movie is inexplicable. This movie is sadly explicable. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, this movie has an ideology and you know, it has an intended audience. Uh, you were saying Brett during the film, hard to imagine anyone like really finding this like entertaining in a way. But um, it had, an, you could see the intended audience. You know, you could you could sort of see the mindset behind it. Whereas after last season is just like, um, yeah, just a, a completely like ancient seeming artifact. Um, and, and like you said, Brett, a movie for no one. Yeah. After last season might be the most movie for no one movie that there is, honestly. Yeah, it turns out that the room was not for no one. It was for a whole wide swath of people. Right. Yeah. Right. But the you know, it was a very circuitous route to that audience. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, the room has great comedic timing, but what intentional or not, it's really like, Oh yeah. I like the room. comedic timing. I definitely like the room. Um, so I hinted at it before, but one moment of the movie that we have to make sure we discuss is the cinnamon buns. What is going <laughs> on with the fucking cinnamon buns? Like what, what do they symbolize in the context of this film? Well, I thought it was to establish that how their memory was working because uh, what's the wife's name? Wendy. It's probably just wife. Okay, Wendy. Um, so Wendy brings up, she's, she asks Carl, what did the cinnamon buns remind you of? And he's like, he's not, he's not taking his uh, forget pills anymore. So he's mm -hmm. like, uh, did I like cinnamon buns or something like that? And then she's like, oh, it reminds me of one of the first times we met and we had these cinnamon buns together for the first time. Mmm, those smell good. Mm. That smell, what does it remind you of? Cinnamon buns. No, really, what does it remind you of? Cinnamon buns? <laughs> what does it remind you of? You know, when we first met, we had cinnamon buns. Did we? Huh. I forgot. He was like, oh, yeah, I don't really remember that. He's faking, of course. Right. Uh, so it was kind of, I felt like they were just trying to find something that if you were taking the pills, you would think about it one day, if, one way if you really liked it. And if you weren't, then you might have like a deeper connection with it. Right. Because they were, they sort of had to do this dance with each other, right? Because even though they were married, they were like uh, a bit cagey about revealing to each other that they had stopped or experimented with not taking their forget pills because it's like subversive to not take your pills right there's yeah. something like that right yeah it's it's would be against the law to not take your pills right. basically and uh early on wendy i think she accidentally drops her last dose um down the sink so then she can't have them that day and i think that's why she stopped then stopped taking them Whereas Carl was working in uh, the uh, family underground or whatever. Right. How did he even get into that? Did either of you understand that? Like how he even made no. his way into this? Okay. <laughs> no. One, one more thing I wanted to say about the cinnamon buns too is that um, <laughs> one, they play this like completely tedious bit with them where like they have some in one scene and then there's another, there's like a different scene Then it comes back and there's like a tray with like less cinnamon buns on it. And she's like, would you like a cinnamon bun? And he's like, I've never had one of these before. It's just like, you know, like one scene ago he had, and it was, it was to show like the, 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 la the total lack of even like short-term memory on this guy. 
Um, and they did that like a third time. It was just like very <laughs> yeah. nightmarish. But the the thing is that this is such an important image in the movie that if you go to the Remember website, you can actually download the cinnamon bun recipe. You can have a multi-dimensional like memory experience by cooking the cinnamon buns. So I just wanted to point that out, you know? Maybe watching this film, remember, you got to find what your cinnamon buns are. You know what I mean? Like, maybe, maybe there's like a sensory totem in your life that, uh, you know, will, will act as as the cinnamon buns did to our, our main characters. And it's important that you find that now because in the not so distant future, you're going to need something to hold on to in, in the depth of your memories and of your soul, your yes. eternal soul. Yes. So if we haven't been completely clear, because there's there's truly a lot to unpack, the main like arc of the film hinges on the fact that everyone has their children forcibly taken from them as soon as they're born, and uh, you take memory pills to repress this. But Carl is actually working in the police force investigating abduction cases of basically, which we later find out are actually parents trying to reclaim their own biological children. Um, that's basically what he's fighting against. But then he sort of becomes a mole on the inside. He starts looking up information on the kids. He somehow has a job like moonlighting as a janitor of like a kid's academy. Not really sure how he's able to work two full-time jobs like that, but it's just like a hobby for him, yeah. I guess. Well, you know, that's the nice thing with being a cop. You can just be like, yeah, I'm out on the beat. And then you can just go do whatever for a few <laughs> you hours. Just, you can just have another job. Yeah. <laughs> a note that we had during the movie that we decided wasn't ultimately maybe a note, but I'm bringing it up now, yeah. is that if this film is... And, and the fact that it's Canadian was revealed over time to us as the viewer. So if this film is telling you cops, hey, take a look at what you're doing, because it seems to be critical police and the government what would the lamb and man family think about black lives matter and the whole yes you know the whole uh defund the police movement now if it's canada it is a little different because this seems to be a distinctly american problem yes but but what do you think they would say we were talking about that yes no i'm so glad you brought mm. that up because like the timing of this movie i think is like crucial to understanding it so and yeah again it's it's going to be difficult for us to not look at it from an American lens. I think we should just go for it. Um, because uh, yeah, should we on. bring up two actual examples? Because yeah. this, in the past few days, uh, there were two different men, one in Wisconsin and one locally in Pasadena yeah. that were family, family men that have kids that were both shot in the back by the police. Yes. Um, and both of them were black, of course, because that's, that's, traditionally how the police operate so um right yeah i would i would hope that the lamb and man see that and they're like that's not right like just on a family person basis they would they would focus on that and feel that it's bad i don't know if they would care necessarily if uh it's just a random single man or something i don't know i would like to think that that logic carries through, you know, to people who in 2012 were saying, you know, the state is trying to pry into our personal lives too much and we need to protect the family unit. I would like to think that people who felt so strongly about that in 2011, 2012, enough to make a film out of it, would look at this news now and be horrified. And maybe some of them are. But my concern is that, you know, conspiracy in the Trump administration, again, I know I'm looking at this in an American way, but conspiracy during the Trump administration versus conspiracy in the Obama administration is like night and day. Um, I feel like nowadays, since, you know, people in sort of the conservative Christian demographic believe that there's someone running the state who's on their side, I don't think they're so concerned with the extension of the state into people's private lives. Um, and I think they mistrust the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I don't know. Yeah. You know, there was actually, you know, Ray Comfort's production company, uh, Living Waters. Yeah. Um, 
he actually did do a video about their stance on Black Lives Matter. Really? And they go into like basically the about section of Black Lives Matter. They twist something to say that they're not about the nuclear family. Fuck. And so they're like, so although we agree in, with the equality, we don't agree with Black Lives Matter because they're anti-nuclear family. What's that about? Can you elaborate on that? Like, what's their reasoning for that? I I could find the actual video. I basically couldn't watch after that, to yeah, be honest. Course. It was Jesus like, Christ. okay, yeah, joke's over here. Um, so I would have to look that up. But um, we, can, we can pipe in the audio for sure from that video. It was a recent one on Instagram. If we feel like subjecting uh, ourselves or our audience to that, but I, I get what you're That's saying. Good, there was yeah. th- there was some language in Black Lives Matter's platform that made one think that like they didn't like the current structure of the nuclear family. Yes, they they chose to take it a certain way, which I thought was a real stretch. Yeah. Oh, uh, one of my favorite things in this whole movie is a graphic that appears on a on a computer monitor that says note Get info on my kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, yeah, that's probably the best, the best screen still in this. The second best being um, one of their clear tablets says loading for a couple seconds. <laughs> it was like, God damn it. Even in 2050. Uh, yeah. It's never going to work how you think it is, you know? Yeah, it's true. Uh, yeah. So. Just some things I, I want to make sure we mention also from the film before we close it out. One interesting side effect, just going back to the like blue goo drug that Carl is abusing to like get his memories back. It's like it's sort of like DMT where like if you if you smoke enough of it, you get to see, visit the machine elves. You know, you get to see the <laughs> the inner workings of the machine. For some reason, it's like when he does enough of this memory goo he like gets warped to a place like a dark room where there's like a silhouette of a guy who looks just from a silhouette exactly like the Heath Ledger Joker. You need to remember, Carl. Don't you get it? I don't want to remember. You have to remember before you can make a difference. What kind of a difference? What are you talking about? How many people have you harmed enforcing the law instead of the truth? read the book um, oh yeah <laughs> and he gets information so like what's that about like what's what's the logic of him being there and like how does that impact the story i think it's a you know have you ever seen ken russell's altered states it's just a flight of fancy it's a it's a place in his mind where he goes also i mean the the most obvious biblical theme if there was one was that when carl's you know in his uh flight of fancy talking to uh the freaking joker um he (laughs) like there's this book that's presented in front of him and it's like he's reading they're not bible verses but they just like say very powerful things on it and the guy in his vision is like this is the truth oh he says i wrote down a quote where he said you will find the light in this book um you know, pretty classic. So I thought that was supposed to be like a biblical allegory, right? You know, you look in the Bible, tells you how to smash the state, you know? Yeah. Um, actually, I wonder if, I wonder if that was a Bible verse. Like if we look back, cause don't they talk about like ancient text at some point? Oh yeah. At one point, one guy goes like, ah, ancient sayings. <laughs> you can, uh, would you mind going back and like trying to, Uh, I have a still of the book written down here at 1721. There's a still. There's probably many in the film, but that's just one that I happen to know. Oh, okay. Yeah, let me, because I I did actually. Yeah, I'm just curious to see if you, because I didn't actually take, I would love to know if that was a Bible verse. There was a point in the film where, like, (laughs) like Carl looks up and, like, on his own wall, like where a Bible verse could be in a Christian household. It's like a saying by Plato. That's like, no child shall know his father. (laughs) It's like, (laughs) man, you guys fucking have bleak ass decorations. Like, come on, like live a little bit. (laughs) Jeez. Yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, so in, in the book, in, um, what the void where he goes to, it says he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children 
and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Uh, Is that a Bible verse? It it sounds like it could be, but I've never heard of it. Let me just do a quick Google of that. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Is that what you said? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Something Malachi 4, 6. And he will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Go off, Malachi. Wow. 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 (laughs) All right. Tell them. They fit it in there. They did. So this was a Christian movie after all. Great job. I mean, it, I, you can't fucking eat, read what's on the book. Like I was, there's so much to look at in this film. Like, you know, I don't exactly need things like pointed at, but the writing on the book that appeared in the film was like not a very big moment. So I, I don't know. I feel it could have been a bit more emphasized than that. Totally. I thought the goo was like programmed to, um, give you specific uh information basically like it has it has a political agenda you mean well like the uh the underground um works on the goo to make it like um uh to give you specific thoughts or like give you information because remember when the police are searching carl's house and they find the goo and they're like fucking goo or whatever right they know what it is yeah well, we were also speculating that the goo is tailored to the individual's DNA or something because the guy who's investigating the main character's house, he wipes the goo on his hand. It doesn't do anything to him. But then again, in the, the prison guard who gets a tiny bit of the toothpaste goo on his hand just goes into a total trance instantly. Right. Yeah. Well, maybe yeah. maybe they had programmed goo to like put him right in the middle of a rave or something. <laughs> uh, programmed goo. This is what we have to look forward to in the in the neoliberal uh, hellscape. Um, Twenty fifty, yeah. baby. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I, I'm more I'm more interested in the director's take on uh, the future and the planet Mars, which seems to be the preoccupation of his new film. Is that so? The film, oh. Yeah, the new film is called Mayflower 2. Oh, Christ. Oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, here's the description. When Miles O'Rourke's brother shows him the hidden Mayflower 2, a ship designed to transport families off the planet to escape persecution, he dismisses it as extremist paranoia. Soon, however, he finds that persecution is real and personal as the authorities come after him. Caught off guard, he borrows the new Mayflower to flee to a paradise colony on Mars where he learns he hasn't left all his troubles behind. Okay. Wow. That sounds great. And is that also going to be shot for $4,000 in the Canadian winter? <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> I, I would love to see it. I mean, hey, they 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 made the best of uh, good 4K on this one. I think they got a lot done. Um, I'm really curious to see Mayflower too. So you have seen my grandpa detective before? No, it came up no, when we were we watching trailers. It's, it's, we still haven't made our way to grandpa detective, but we're very enamored with the concept. It's on the list. It's on the list. It's on the list. <laughs> it does sound like I, I would watch it. Right. It also does sound like a Hong Kong eighties movie. So the plot yes. of that is a, yeah, totally a, a police detective is partnered with his estranged grandfather to investigate a series <laughs> of robberies. <laughs> That's like a Stephen Chow movie or a Jackie Chan movie or something. Yeah, yeah Sam O'Hung's definitely in it. <laughs> um, uh, let's let's make sure. I'm just trying to see if there's any other like aspects of the film that I want to be sure we mention. I I want to mention the fact that like in the film we see a couple different like school and like daycare settings where there's like adults in charge of a lot of kids like on behalf of the state. And what was really fun is that like the kids aren't allowed to play, like pretend to be like moms and dads, like like b- the girls can't play with like baby dolls. They have to like hide. It's like a subversive thing. Um, oh yeah, they have like the that rolled up blanket with like a ball on top for the head, and then they're like, Haha, just playing with this ball. <laughs> yeah, and the the woman who's like you know overseeing them is like. You, I know what you're doing. You play over here where I can see you. <laughs> and uh, also that really funny moment when um, 
the like bully takes the kid's kickball and they're like, give the ball back. And the bully's like, no one owns anything. <laughs> like, it's not your <laughs> ball. And it's like, holy shit. Missing something? Yes. Can you please have my ball? It's your ball. Since when is anything yours? We were playing with it. That makes it yours, does it? We just want to play with it. Nothing belongs to anyone. Everything belongs to everyone. Please. Like uh, six-year-olds uh, blast socialism with common sense, you know? Uh, <laughs> pretty fucking classic. But, um, well, let's say then, for our purposes... Uh, I would actually say that was a pretty comprehensive discussion of Remember. I've honestly got to recommend this one to our audience. Uh, I, First of all, this one is is it pretty obscure. I think you're going to have to like buy the DVD. Isn't that what we did? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I paid for the digital file. It, you can either, uh, dear listeners, uh, they present you with two options when you come to the site for purchasing this. One is two for, I want to say, $11.49 get the full HD version of the movie or you can pay like 1235 and you get like all these extras with it too so so keep that in mind yeah we did like this is a homegrown production like i don't think you're going to be able to like you know pirate this one you know support listen support men of faith and their their film endeavors okay um <laughs> buy the dvd or digital file of remember but uh, let's uh, let's give everyone the official boys Bible study rating. What do you say, boys? What do we think of this one? I give it eighty six out of eighty six pinch and throws. Because <laughs> there's a lot of pinching and throwing in this movie. They cannot stop showing you that special effect. Oh God, yeah. Honestly, I thought it was more practically done than in Minority Report. Like it made sense more sense to me here than it does in Minority Report. That's, I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> I I really love this movie. Um, it gave me so much to think about, um, so much to remember. And I would give it 10 out of 10 uh, fresh cinnamon bun rolls. It gives me <laughs> memories of all sorts uh, with my loved ones and with my belly. Yeah. Uh, well, I would give this film... I think I, I would just rate this film um, everything and nothing because like I don't own this film. The filmmakers don't even own this film. Like this film is everyone's oh. film, you know, um, uh, we, you know, we, we are all uh, dutiful citizens of the state. What we have is theirs. What they have is ours. So uh, that, that's what I would give this perfect film by director, uh, what's his name? Daniel La Dal Dallas Lammerman and writer Greg Lammerman. Um, shout outs to my boys, the Lammermans. Um, Lammerman. Lammermans. Lammermans. Um, <laughs> it's Lammerman. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Brett, I thank you so much for watching this film with us and, and spending time on the pod. It was a pleasure. I, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. I've been listening since the beginning. You guys are Aww. funny. I enjoy it. Oh, thanks. Well, thanks, Brett. Great to have you. I mean, I, I don't know. I've been in L.A. Actually, this week is my sixth year in L.A. And like basically since the time I got here, I've been going to your screenings um, over the years. You've done so much cool stuff. Um, so it's great to have you on. Big part of the L.A. film scene. Obviously, you have Museum of Home Video. Uh, we talked about it in the beginning, but can you remind people where and when to watch that and also... Uh, if there's anything else you have coming up next, you'd like to shout out. Uh, that's that's all. It's a lot. Um, it's a weekly found footage show on Twitch. It's called the Museum of Home Video every Tuesday night from 730 to 9 Pacific. And uh, it's free to watch things on Twitch. Although if you want to participate in the chat, which is vital if you want the full experience, I would suggest signing up for a Twitch account. Yeah, so much fun. Um, yeah, you are a listener. If you, if you do that, you will more likely than not see me and or Scott and or Julian just like hanging out in chat one night because I, I really enjoy watching it and a great programming. And on our end, uh, the boys Bible study end, let me remind everyone that uh, we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash boys Bible study. If you subscribe for $5 a month or more, you get access to 
two or more bonus episodes that we will never release to the public that are yours for the listening. Um, I also want to shout out our patron saints of the pod at the $20 tier. Uh, We have Nicole and Marissa. Thank you so much for your support. And thanks for everyone who pledges. Um, We also do monthly live streams. If you pledge at the $1 tier or higher, uh, once a month, we are going to have an exclusive live stream of secret Christian content for you. Uh, We're planning our September one now. We don't have a date yet, but we will let you know. Um, Our outro song is Oh My God by Mary. Stream Mary on Bandcamp and Spotify. Uh, With that said, on behalf of myself, Ash, my co-hosts, Scott and Julian, and our special guest today, Brett Berg, we would like to say, peace be with you. And with you. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I feel your love in me, it's coming from within Oh my God My devotion is so unwavering Divine emotions when you enter me Every day